Today's podcast is brought to you by Eddy. Find better candidates, conduct more focused interviews, and make data-driven hiring decisions. Hire Eddy, hire faster, hire smarter, hire more. Learn more at eddy.com. Now, let's podcast. Welcome to Disrupt Salt Lake City. My name is Jared Olson, and I am joined today with James Hadlock, the founder of Blue Novus, and Jordan Bogard, the president of Payroll HR Solutions. How are you guys doing today? Hey, hey, doing great. Thank you. Fantastic. James is a previous keynote presenter at Disrupt HR Boise, and uh, Jordan previously spoke at Disrupt HR Salt Lake City at the third event that we put on. And uh, I just kind of want to hear a little bit about, as, as alumni for the Disrupt <laughs> crew, what has your experience been like being part of this network and, and part of this group and, and the effort that we're trying to do to get the word out there about changing human resources? Um, James, what was your experience like it in Boise? So it was the very first event, and I know that the founders were, were obviously very excited. I was very excited. I had heard a lot about Disrupt just in general, but I didn't know what to expect. Yeah. I, I had never attended an event because it is, it's fairly new in our area, and uh, it was a raging success. I mean, they had standing room only, amazing content, tons of innovators, and just, a, just a, 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 an energetic group. That's awesome. And Jordan, everyone's going to remember you because of the Chewbacca costume, man. What? So what's the love with Star Wars or is it it's just Chewbacca or like, tell us what made you think, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to wear a Chewbacca costume in this. So I wouldn't say that I'm like a Star Wars nerd, but uh, my kids, like my oldest is nine years old and he loves Star Wars. So like ever since all the new ones have come out, since he was probably four years old, yeah. we've gone to those together. But uh, I think I was just kind of putting two and two together with Solo coming out and Chewbacca. Yeah. That was the main reason. And I like to, you know, present in a different way. And so... You like to disrupt. Yeah, exactly. Disrupt. That's the word I was looking for. That's the word. (laughs) And see, welcome to disrupt. So we find great minds like this. Well, um, uh, one of the things that I want to talk about today, uh, we, we're going to have people listening to this podcast that are trying to sell a service or a product or get in through human resources, work with them in one fashion or another. And my experience has been that HR historically are really bad purchasers. They're not good at it because they... They, one, don't understand how to communicate value to a CFO. They feel very disconnected from the financials. And uh, they see a lot of threat some of the time with new products or services coming in that is for them. And and they feel more comfort in controlling everything their own. And I want to discuss with both of you, because you've got some really innovative approaches of how to get in with human resources and sell to them. So um, I know HR hates being sold to, and this podcast is about how to sell to human resources, right? And we're disrupt, and so we want to help the people that are trying to make an impact there. And I think you guys have done it in a great way that doesn't come across as quote-unquote salesy. Um, and, and so I would just like your opinions a little bit on why do you think HR is having such a difficult time purchasing and sharing that information? And, and James, a question for you. I mean, you've only been working with HR for five months now. And in that short amount of time, you have made a massive splash and impact in the industry and made great connections. How have you got in with HR so quickly and so well? I think uh, it goes back to really one of my core values and, and where I come from, and that is is make it about the other person. So a lot of times, especially in the sales cycle, you know, it's all about I'm going to show them my benefits, I'm going to show them how I'm going to change their life, I'm going to do, and it's always I, 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 instead of you, 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 you. And the moment that you can put yourself in their shoes and, and gain a better understanding about where they're coming from, uh, I think you're ahead of the game. So an example of that is, is you know, if you're solving a problem for them, instead of you talking about your product solving a problem for them, just talk about you're solving a problem for them. Yeah. The, the product, they're going to ask you about the product. They're going to ask you about how they can integrate that. And so number one is, is make it about them. Uh, number two is you've got to have something that's going to get their attention. Like it, it, it's, it's, it's got to be something that brings tremendous value to them. And whether that's, if you have a commodity, 
um, you've got to maybe deliver it in a different way or your service has got to be exemplary, right? And so it's, it's about coming out and doing something that makes it easier for them and it makes it about them. It makes their job easier. So, you know, I don't ever, it's so funny because people have told me for years, you're one of the best sales guys. In fact, I, I'm part of a networking group and he's like, you can sell my product better than I can. I want you to come to some of my meetings. And I'm like, I, what's funny is I don't see myself as a salesperson. Yeah. I see myself as a connector and a problem solver. And I, I think that type of mindset is is what's provided me with so much success in in, in uh, integrating or at least getting inside of the HR uh, world. Now, something I would also love your in, insight on as a as a founder of several companies and CEO. Um, what preconceived notions did you have about human resources? And as you've created this new company that is primarily sold through HR, um, what did you think coming in? And, and uh, what concerns did you have in working with HR uh, when you were a CEO and now working with them from a different perspective? So when I, when I had a number of my companies, I felt like, because I, like, I, mean, I, I run really fast when I launch something, and I felt like they're going to hamper us. They're going to slow us down. It wasn't really in a light that was positive. It was more. It was more. Oh, they're here to mitigate risk. They're here to probably keep me out of trouble. But I don't even want to hear that stuff. You know, I just want to go, go, go. And so I think a preconceived notion that I had was they're a necessary evil. Mm -hmm. And that's what so many people think. So, Jordan, you yeah. have had experience in HR. How do we change that perception of in the HR industry of being a necessary evil? So, interesting question. I, I kind of had an aha moment when James was speaking of how similar the two of us are. And so, I've been in sales my entire career, but uh, I've never been the type of sales rep that does like the dog and pony show and, you know, big things like that. But um, I've kind of learned this as I've gotten older that... Uh, my thing is, is, is how can I help you? And I, I truly am a problem solver. And so when I think of ways to benefit HR, you know, a, a task like payroll um, can be automated. And there's many tools within payroll, whether it's doing the HR or it's integrating their time and attendance solution, that we can free up their time to truly have those people specialize in what they're the best at. So what I've learned is like, and I've even seen this happen multiple times, is Maybe they, they're truly passionate about HR because they want to help people, but their actual true passion is, is doing something else, whether it's, um, for example... Playing spike ball. Exactly. <laughs> Love me some spike ball. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe they, they just want to recruit because they want to help people get jobs. And so instead of doing those mundane tasks of being HR generalist and running payrolls and doing those tasks, they could actually be out recruiting and bringing value to the company and helping them grow. So, so you have seen, I, I'm assuming, uh, a lot of HR people view you as a threat. For sure. Yeah, my, my first experience in, in HR would have been probably ADP. And so I started there, like my first job out of college was back in 2009. And so with that, um, a lot of the HR people thought that I was coming to replace them because payroll is a task that HR was responsible for. And so we were an outsourced solution. We could do it at a lower cost. We could do it faster. Um, but uh, with that being said, sometimes they would be intimidated to work with me because they thought I was trying to take their job. Yeah. So how do you overcome that? Just by focusing on who, what, who they are as a person and what their actual interests and hobbies are? Or, or how do you get past an administrative HR person who only sees their job valued as processing payroll? And when they lose that, they don't see the strategic future of HR, so they see you as a, uh, as a risk. So I would say it's, it's all about the questions you ask them, right? And so if you ask them questions just about payroll, you're going to talk about just payroll, right? But if you open it up and ask about the company and how things are going and understanding different processes, whether it's marketing or whether it's their accounting or whether it's understanding their true payroll process from hire to fire, so when they're onboarding in clients to all the way to when they're terminating them, performance reviews and stuff like that, they're going to realize that they're not just a payroll person, that there's so much more value that they're bringing to the table besides doing that processing that they could actually take on other tasks to help the company grow and bring an ROI in. And uh, it's much more valuable for them. So. Okay. Now, something you said uh, a little bit earlier, Jordan, that I have really uh, respected about you is you are online. I see you regularly on LinkedIn doing a post saying, 
hey, who needs something? Like, who can I help? Yeah. Um, and you reach out individually to, to certain people and see how you can assist them. Um, one, do people take you up on that? And then two, uh, what, how has that helped you in this indirect sales model? So I'd say one, yes, people take me up on it all the time. What are some of the weirdest requests people have sent you? <laughs> the weirdest requests? Don't tell them mine. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've had too many weird ones. I would say a majority of them have been to help them get a job. Okay. And so I've been able to place quite a few people. I'm not a recruiter, but I would say throughout my career, I've, I've hired over 200 people. And so with that being said, I've gotten very good at understanding what people want to do. And I've worked with so many different thousands of companies that there's always someone that I can connect them to, to to find that job. So I'd say that's the primary reason people reach out to me. Okay. And it also helps you know when an HR person is leaving that they need someone to do payroll. So that's how you kind of get into like, this is the benefit of it as well. But you're not leading with, I want to take over your payroll. No, I'm a a huge believer in karma. So there's many times that I'll I'll go into a sales pitch and uh, I'll ask my standard questions and get to know the company, get to know the individual. And by the time I leave, their payroll solution could be working. Um, the only reason they would switch is for a relationship, yeah. which happens, um, yeah. and it's great, and I, I love it. But uh, I may walk out and help them replace their accounting department or help them do something that they didn't even want to do. And, and two years down the road or six months down the road, they're like, holy cow, Jordan came in and helped me because he truly wanted to benefit me as a person and as a company. He didn't even take my payroll over, but I just had my payroll screwed up last week by so-and-so. I want to reach out to Jordan again, and, and that comes back to me. So it's, it's benefited me by doing that. That's awesome. Um, James, talk to us a little bit about what you're doing with Into the Blue TV. I mean, this is a really cool way of focusing just on people, right, and helping them out as well. So give us the thought process behind it, the motivation, and actually what that looks like. Yeah, so Into the Blue TV is a passion project. It's There's no end game. Uh, there's no uh, there, There's nothing to monetize with it. Uh, for the last nine and a half, ten years, my wife and I have facilitated a lot of groups and a lot of trainings around personal development and leadership. And one of the things we've learned through that process is the power of inquiry and asking thought-provoking questions. And why that is so relevant is when, when, you, when you take people out of kind of the canned responses, you know, like, hey, how are you doing today? I'm good. Instead of those kind of pre, you know, the ones that we've just, that we respond to without even thinking about it, when you start to ask people really inquisitive, kind of off the wall questions, you take them to open up. They they are deep questions. That's right. And so, so that's a little bit of the background that kind of was the precursor to Into the Blue. And back in June, you know, I'm a busy guy. I'm, I've, I've got a lot of trainings and speaking and consulting that I do around and the country. Kids at home. Tons of kids at home. We have six of our nine kids at home, which is craziness at times. All the time. <laughs> uh, but I just, I had this, call it a nudge or intuition or gut feeling that I, I, I got to start showcasing people and, and I've got one big message with this. And, 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 you know, there's certainly been a lot that's happened because I've started this project. But it, it came out of just this pure nudge of wanting to follow that premonition of something I needed to do to give back to the world. And the message is that, one, we're all connected. Um, we all go through things. Um, we're not alone in going through those things. And, and we really do, each and every one of us has access to tremendous wisdom that other people can learn and, and grow from. And, and so Into the Blue is a very short daily episode. So I post a new episode every single day. I committed to doing that for the next year. And I interview people from literally all over the world. And I have a system, and I, I'm happy to share what that system is, yeah. because it's... As simple as it is, understanding human nature and how these questions really work, um, I've yet to have a bad interview. I think I've posted over 150 interviews already this year, and uh, it's super simple. I always ask the same first question, which is kind of an icebreaker, and it gets them kind of out of their head, which I've noticed works really well. And then I always ask the same last question, and it's a powerful last question. But in the middle, I've got two to three questions 
um, that I invite the guests to just pick a number between 1 and 50. And so it's super random. It's super spontaneous for both of us. So even I don't know where it's going to go. And, and the other thing I've learned is I don't have any rebuttal. I, I typically will just say thank you. But I, I leave it at, I give them complete space to really just showcase them. And man, I've had people call me after I've interviewed them and, and share with me the impact that it had on their personal life. I've had people that have watched an episode that called me up or messaged me that said that it impacted their life. I think there's this idea that, you know, gurus out there are the only ones that have access to this wisdom. And it's just simply not true. Mm -hmm. So here's what's been fascinating about Into the Blue TV. I can go into a big company and they've heard of me really, because of Into the Blue. Or, or I can go somewhere and you know they have seen one of the videos and didn't know that it was me that was producing that. And it has been, just by default, probably one of the best branding opportunities and again that's not where it, it was birthed from and it has nothing to do with your product either right? and it has nothing to do with what i do i mean it, it's and it on average it takes me about an hour a day because i'm the only one who touches it i do the interview i do the questions i do the editing and i do all the posting and i mean i repurpose stuff and it is i mean frankly it's one of my most favorite things to do yeah and it drives me purpose wise it gives me so much fulfillment and, and i'll share this because it's it's literally where i just came from so i don't know if you've heard of roots high school which is a charter school that is a farm um that is fascinating to me when i when i when i uh, talked with the, with the gentleman who started it with tyler bastion i was blown away and i was connected to him by by someone we all know aubrey bates yep Aubrey is on their board, and she's like, "You two need to meet." And seriously, within five minutes, she—I didn't—I had no—I'd never heard of this school before. But within five minutes, I had one of those that, those next nudges. I'm like, "I need to come down and interview your students." So I just got back from doing 19 interviews today. Wow, that's awesome! And and to hear voices of these youth that you know that this is supposedly a school for troubled youth. And yet, I'm just telling you right now, I promise you, you go watch those 19 when they're ready to come out, whenever they come out, you're going to get something out of them. Cool. It's going to allow you to connect. And so, man, we, we could do a whole podcast just on, on what I've learned over the last six months with that project. But it is a, it is a mind-blowing project. Um, I, I've, I've told this to many people, and I'm in the job of development, right? Human development. And it might be one of the most important jobs that I have. Talking to people about who they are and asking probing questions. It's the best. And it's built your brand at the same time. <laughs> right. Which is crazy. Yeah. Karma, right? I guess. It's not your I mean, intention, no. but it still is helping. Well, here's, I, I, I have recognized this. If you want to know what James Hadlock is about, just go watch one of those 150 episodes yeah. or 200 episodes or whatever number we're on now. That's amazing. They're also genuine. That's what I was about. Yeah. yeah. You were on one. Shh. Yeah. I was. Thanks for that, interview. by the way. <laughs> what number fun. were you? Like, I don't remember. 140 Probably, something Yeah, something ish? like that. Yeah, I was around 150, I think. I cool. loved it. And I love I loved getting to share all the little nuggets on my stories with it yeah. and you talking about your wife. And by the way, if you don't know this, people... Um, he talks about how he is a tremendous salesman because of his um, of being able to get his wife. You totally... That's right. You totally... She, I don't know. I don't know. I still don't know what she's thinking. <laughs> Every day, I just don't get it. I, I pick my wife at, at 7-Eleven, so I mean... <laughs> oh, snap. That's good. Okay, so Jordan, question for you as yeah. well about just selling. Something you've done a great job with is networking, right? Um, not only how can I help you, but you've created a lot of networking groups. And I'd love if you could maybe explain that. And is it a direct sales opportunity or is it just general good and goodwill? And that leads to referrals as well. Uh, great question. So, I, I mean, I've been introduced to networking, geez, I don't even know how long ago, um, whether it was my first BNI that I went to and stuff like that. And I wasn't a huge fan of kind of the formal networking and kind of like you were forced to, to give leads. And so about three years ago, um, I was at a company and I knew I wasn't going to be there for the long term. And so with that being said, I started networking. And the way I did it is there wasn't a morning that went by that I didn't take someone to breakfast. 
there wasn't a lunch that went by that I didn't take someone to lunch. And so I would take them and get to know them better so that I could kind of find out. It was kind of selfish back then because I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do next. Yeah. But through that, I developed so many amazing relationships and friendships through that that uh, I started a networking group. And this networking group is people that I've worked with for probably the past 10, 15 years. And I would consider them to be the best of the best of what they do, whether they're business owners or VPs of sales or, you know, chief marketing officers. It doesn't really matter, but I truly do consider them to be the best of the best. And so when we get together once a month, we never talk about referring business back and forth. We talk about what's happening in the market. We talk about what's happening in our lives. And, and we truly get to know each other and bounce ideas off each other. And yes, sometimes we will have someone present, but it's something relative that, that's happening in the industry right now. And so, for example, we had someone present on security back in, in August because it was a big threat to multiple of our, our companies and things that we were dealing with. And that's where we you know, started two-factor authentication and doing things that we hadn't done before. And it benefited us. But uh, does business happen? Absolutely. Because every time I walk into a meeting and one of the people that I network with, their topic comes up when I'm asking my probing questions. I introduce them to them, and those those relationships just happen. That's awesome. Okay, so you've got a really cool story as well about um, selling something to a company and them instead just wanting to hire you. <laughs> tell that tell that story because that's a good one. <laughs> so, so my secrets, huh? the the way I, I get into businesses. So um, I'm all about relationships, and so if I want to get into Zima, I would find you know four or five people that I'm connected to that know Jared. And I would find a way to, to connect with him, right? So I would say, you know, Thane, I know Thane really well. I would take Thane to lunch. And during that conversation, yes, I wanted to go to lunch with Thane. But at the same time, I would say, hey, both of us are connected with Jared. What's he like? Is he cool to work with? Tell me a little bit about him. And uh, I would kind of get the dirt and the scope of who Jared truly was. And if I feel like I didn't get enough information and how I could benefit Jared, I'd go to the next person that uh, knew Jared. And so anyways, through that strategy, three or four people would end up talking to Jared and say, hey, I went to lunch with Jordan. You should talk to him. He's awesome. He's great at doing this or whatever it may be. And so I think the story you're, you're asking about is uh, there was a financial advisory firm. And so I was newer to ADP. I hadn't been there probably more than a year. And uh, anytime we heard a competitor's name, we would, we would target that person, right? Oh, they're outsourcing payroll. They already believe in what we're doing. They're just using the wrong company. I'm going to go sell them, right? And so this one firm, I found like four people that I, I personally knew that worked there. And so I took every single one of them to lunch as I did my networking thing. And uh, as I went to lunch with them, I would bring up obviously what I was doing and we would talk about it. And within three to four weeks, the owner of the company reached out to me. He's like, I don't know what it is, Jordan, but I have to meet with you because I've had four of my employees come talk to me and say that I need to work with you. And so I'm like, okay, great. We set the meeting. I I get there. I sit down. And the first thing the guy does is is pull out a checkbook. And I'm like, what is this guy doing pulling out a checkbook? I'm I'm here to, to sell payroll. That's what I do, right? But uh, he pulled out his check, but he's like, how much commission are you going to make on this check? And I'm like, I don't know, a couple hundred bucks. So he's like trying to write me out a check for $400. And I'm like, no, 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 don't worry about it. I'm just here to see what I can do to help you out, you know, kind of thing. But uh, he's like, I don't care about payroll. I want to find out how you have four of my people come talk to me and say that I need to work with you. Because I've never had that happen before. And uh, he ended up trying to offer me a job, but uh, we're still good friends. I, I didn't end up working there, obviously, but... Uh, I realized from that moment forward that that's the best way to, to do business. So. That's amazing. It's the same thing that happened with Under Armour trying to get Steph Curry. So they wanted him as their primary sponsor, and he wasn't interested in them because they were a not, a, not a big name. And so they targeted his teammates and just spiffed the crap out of them. And so they got all this free stuff. And Steph one day is like, how do I get free stuff? And they said, go to Under Armour. And then he actually signed up as Under Armour's primary sponsor. So uh, it's a brilliant model that you guys are talking about here. And, And the best part is it's with all good intention. It's not like you're actually trying to sell. You're genuinely caring about people and how to help others and focusing on them. And, uh, and karma happen, happens, and good things seem to come back from it. So any other nuggets or pieces of advice that you would offer to people trying to sell to human resources? I would say it's just exactly what James said. Don't focus on yourself, right? Focus on the individual that you're meeting with. Find ways that you can truly benefit them. I mean, there's been times I'll go in and, and sell a deal but I won't even sell my deal. I will find out what they're truly struggling with at that moment. If it's not payroll, yeah, I want to get business and I want to get a commission check or make money or what it may be, but I truly want to help them out. And so there's been multiple times where I would help them out in a different situation, whether it was their marketing or getting them a new accounting process or whatever it may be. 
And uh, I know that car's back come back to me, and it has multiple times, whether it's six months down the road and something gets messed up on payroll, and like, holy cow, Jordan was awesome. He truly came to help me out. I'm going to go move to his payroll company now, too. So uh, I would say do what you can to benefit them and focus on what they're struggling with. It's awesome. When I was 18 or 19 years old, I was reading, I don't even remember the book, but it was Zig Ziglar. And I have remembered it to this day. And it went something like, if you will help enough other people get what they want, you'll always get what you want. Mm -hmm. And that has stuck with me as one of my primary foundational approaches to, you know, working with people. Yes, do I want to be sustainable and have, have deals come my way? Of course I do. But the moment that I go out of my way to help them, I mean, l let, let's face it. Building trust is what drives sales, yeah. right? Whether they trust the product and they need that product or they trust you, but when that all converges and, and you're building trust because you're helping them get something that they need, well, if they're truly a qualified customer for you, they're going to come to you. Like you're going to build trust equity with them. And I, I, think that's, I think that's the most valuable currency we have is trust. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's hard because there's a lot of sales reps and there's a lot of people that aren't genuine that I've run into. And they'll do whatever it takes to, to get that commission check. Uh, whether it's telling lies or over-promising and under-delivering. But uh, when you truly do everything you can to benefit that person, and maybe it's not your product, uh, I promise you you're going to get deals another way. So That's awesome. And so for all those HR people out there listening to this saying, we hate it when we get sold to, um, Disrupt SLC, we want salespeople to focus on helping you. And when you're being helped, then you're not being sold to, and you make good connections, and then you can make more informed decisions. So let's talk a little bit more about that in information that we need to actually make a purchase. Um, James, what you are doing in, in Blue Novus to change addiction recovery is a disruptor in the market. Will you talk to us a little bit about what your company is all about um, and, and how it's changing the human resource profession and benefits that are offered out there? Yeah, let me be clear. That's not what I set out to do. Yeah. Um, I think going back to what this whole thing has been about is I saw, I saw a, a market that was being completely underserved and I just wanted to see if we could fix that problem. So it wasn't even an HR-focused deal. Yeah. It was literally just... You know, my, my wife and I were working with uh, some treatment facilities, addiction recovery, reha rehab centers, if you, if you know, the 30 day, 28 day, whatever. And one of the things that we noticed is how many times when a business person would call and was seeking for help for whatever their, their struggles in addiction were, the biggest fear they had is what is going to happen to my job? So, so right off, we knew that there was some confusion about what their situation was at work. You know, what, am I going to get fired? What's going to happen? What's going to happen if I disclose this? And, and that really stuck with us. And so over the last couple of years, we started to look at how could we address that better? Because, you know, we, we were familiar with EAPs, an employee assistance program. We had heard about them. But the more that we drilled down and we started to go out into the market, and I was doing what you were doing, Jordan. I was taking a lot of HR people out to lunch because not that I wanted to pitch anybody. I was actually trying to learn. Understand. Like I wanted to understand, you know, what do you do in this situation? Like what do you really do? What do you say you do? You know, what are the solutions that are available out there? And here's what we came to, to understand. Nobody, and I mean nobody, talks about addiction in the workplace. It is, it is as big a taboo topic as anything that I can think of. How big is addiction in the workplace? What kind of stats do you have? So the stats are big. Um, right now, we know that 23 million people in the United States that we know about struggle with addiction. And I'm very confident in saying I think that number is at least double that. But there's at least half the people out there that aren't going to reveal that, right? Of, of all the people that struggle with addiction... 77% of them have a job. So do that math really quick. That's, you know, that, that's over 15 million people, right? So I think the number is 17 million. So 17 million people that we know about that have a job are struggling with addiction. And define addiction. Are we just talking drug, drug and, and alcohol? alcohol? Okay. That's specifically substance abuse. And, you know, the numbers for other addictions, whether it's food or pornography, 
Um, you know, dot, dot, dot. I don't have those numbers okay. readily available. Even bigger. <laughs> massive, yeah. massive, massive. So, so the one thing we, we discovered is that one, it was taboo, like companies had a hire and fire model. So, so I looked at that and I'm like, I wonder what the economics of that are. And, and all of a sudden we started to, to, to do the math and we were starting to notice, my gosh, companies not addressing addiction, because here's what I believe. Companies don't address addiction because they feel like, well, it's just going to cost me more money or it's going to be more trouble. And so I just, I'm just going to kind of sweep it under the rug. And what we can quantify, and this is based, I mean, we went to the SHRM websites, we went to um, drug-free workplace websites. So I'm getting all of this content and this information, all these stats from this industry, an industry that I wasn't in, yeah. right? And what the math and the data tells us is that that it is costing you way more money to not address it than it would be if you were to address it. In fact, so much that you'd be better off as an HR director to pay cash out of your pocket to send someone to treatment if it actually works. Mm. Which led me to the second problem we wanted to solve. So we wanted to solve the problem of not only reducing stigma and helping people in the workplace and addressing that more effectively, but the other problem was from my industry itself, and that was that if you do your research, what you're going to discover is there's 15,000 treatment centers in the, in the United States. 15,000. And the success rates are single digit, less than 8%. In fact, some reports are 4 to 6%. And when I looked at that, I'm like, one, I'm embarrassed. Like, what industry do you know that, that is worth $35 billion has a 4 to 6% success rate? It's crazy. Right? So I didn't want to just help people in the workplace and make that a smoother transition. I wanted to literally disrupt an entire industry and change it and, and make the industry more accountable because my, my own experience is the more accountable and the more you track, it, you, you automatically will get better, right? Would we agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah. So we wanted to figure out a way to, to also kind of force an industry to be more accountable to the people that they were serving. Because what company wants to, and this is why companies don't do it either, what company wants to let you go for the next 30 days and go to a treatment center and then know that when you come back, you're going to be struggling and you've got a less than 10% success rate? Like, what kind of an investment do you want to make in that? Yeah. Not, not very often. Yeah, not a great investment. So we felt like we had to address both. We, we had to fix both how it is addressed and looked at in the workplace, and we also had to improve the success rates or at least improve the service. And so what we've done is we have a simple, we have a, a care number. We have a phone number that is anonymous, that is confidential. We don't report to HR, yet we become the professional handholder. So employees and their loved ones, so it's not even tied necessarily directly to, you know, the number of employees you have. It's, it's actually for anyone that's tied to your company in general. It could be a family member. So we provide that number, so it's an off-base number, and um, that number is 1-833-JUST-CARE. So it's super easy to remember, you know, kind of like a 1-800 contacts. We, we felt like the, the easier we made it for people to connect with us, the better. So that was number one, is we wanted to give them an outlet. One of the things that I've learned is people won't call because they feel shame, they feel like they're alone, they feel like someone's gonna report them to HR and their job's gonna be in trouble. So we, we tried to solve all of that by becoming that third party. But the other piece, and, and what's so interesting is, is, and this was what surprises HR, and I get this question 100% of the time um, when I share with them that that phone number is free for their company. So we don't charge for that service. Okay, so how does the billing happen? And that's the question I get every yep. single time. So the way we are sustainable, this is not a nonprofit. It's how we solve the second problem. We go and we vet out, so we basically become a steward for your companies and we vet out the best of the best treatment facilities and we have a certification model. So those treatment centers that want to be a part of that referral or that pool of, and have access to all those employees, they must go through a rigorous certification process, no different than a five-star hotel would go through. You know, they, they, have to, they have to up their game. They have to be better than everybody else. And, and the hope with that in tracking outcomes and making sure that their family program and their support system is in place better than anyone else in the country, 
Well, the hope is, is that when they return from that, that stint in treatment, that they have a better chance of success. So we're, we've, we, we've, we've definitely turned the entire model upside down, which is a huge risk, by the way. To this, we don't know if, it's, if we're going to actually pull it off. <laughs> But our sense is, is that, gonna pull it off. That, that we yeah. are going to pull it off. Yeah. And, and the reason is, is because so far up to this point, we haven't had anyone turn us away. Like companies are coming to us left and right. They love it. Um, and, and on the back end, you know, frankly, it helps treatment centers. It helps treatment centers to, 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 to do a couple of things. They get those connections, right? So they, they, they in some, some uh, and, and they're going to be held at this higher regard. Like it is, an, it is going to be an elite, elite, elite group of, of providers that even get access to, to working in this care initiative. That's amazing. Okay, so brand new benefit that no one is offering out there. And now we can actually help people when they're struggling with addiction, when they need help the most, and it doesn't cost the employer or the employee anything. That's right. That's that's a disruptive <laughs> idea right there. Oh, James. yay. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. So, Jordan, payroll is something we all have to do in, in human resources. It's been around for a very long time. What are some of the trends or things that you're seeing that's changing the way payroll works and eliminating the need to do so much administrative uh, payroll and HR work? Uh, great questions. I mean, these are all the questions I asked myself when I started this company, right? I worked for two big companies, um, and with that being said, I realize that there's three things that when it comes down to payroll. The first thing is price, right? You've got to have a fair price. That's just, it is what it is. Um, the second thing is technology. There's, there's a lot of great technologies out there, I'm not going to lie. I mean, whether it's the ADPs, the Paychecks, the Heartlands, the Paylossies, wherever it may be, there's a lot of great technologies out there that can accomplish your payroll needs, right? But uh, the third and probably the most important one is the customer service. And I think that's where it's primarily broken. Um, it's very difficult when something goes wrong and something always goes wrong with payroll. Whether it's the customer's fault or it's our fault as a payroll company, there's so many different moving pieces that things just happen. Um, and so it's all about how you get those things resolved and how you get them fixed, right? And so when it comes down to technology and customer service like that, I think those are kind of the two key out of the three. And so with technology, let's start with that one. Um, the biggest thing that's trending right now is having one proprietary system or having multiple systems that API into one solution to make your life easier, right? And so if you have a lot of W-2 employees and 1099 employees um, and you have employees that are on salaries, employees that clock in, stuff like that, that changes the way you're going to do the payroll. And so having multiple systems to track, first and foremost, the employees through the HRS system, but second, to have a solution for like a time and attendance and really, truly have a solution that's going to benefit them and not allow people to buddy punch or clock in or clock out when they're not at the office. It's having those, that type of technology and bringing it into one solution that, uh, that makes that HR general's life so much easier. But uh, it's been interesting the, the past year as we've kind of developed in this company, um, the things that I'm realizing as we work with the HR generalists and then we kind of dive into the solutions and how we can benefit them, they don't really care about the payroll itself. They don't particularly care maybe about time and tens their solutions working for it but as we start to talk about how you hire employees all the way to how you fire them and how you're doing performance reviews and things that are kind of out of the norm for an HR generalist to do they're like well shoot we're not focusing on those things right now we're truly not we're focusing on making sure employees get paid and so if you could take that away from me and I don't have to struggle about it I can focus on my employees and my retention which we are struggling with right now which I would say almost everyone's struggling with right now because People are jumping ship and moving jobs on a regular basis, especially here in Utah with how well the market's doing. I mean, our, our employment rate's lower than 3%. And so to help those HR generalists see what they can focus on above and beyond the mundane task of, of payroll and stuff like that and benefit admin and things and, and such like that, to have it in one system that kind of integrates and, and brings it all to one together, they can focus on the things that they're struggling with and it makes their, their job better and they're benefiting the company at the same time. So. It's awesome. Interesting stuff coming out. But that holistic software approach of just one one tool to take care of your HRS, ATS, Ben Admin, like everything out there, 
Man, that that needs some love, right? Yeah. And and we're hoping to see more of those things come out. Well, thank you guys so very much for your time. Um, just a, as a parting question I have for both of you. I mean, you're both uh, running businesses that you have founded. You're both helping other people on a regular basis, running networking groups, speaking. You guys are all over the place. Um, any tips on how uh, or suggestions on how to balance all of this, specifically as it relates to focusing on the person? Um, because so many mundane tasks come up that we have to execute, how do you make sure that the individual is always the priority during your very hectic days? It's kind of a deep question. <laughs> deep <laughs> questions! We like those. Are you going to be on End of the Blue next, or is that going to be one of the questions that come up? <laughs> I'm making a note of it now. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Um... I, I have a lot of different models and things like that, but uh, one of them is, is control what you can control, right? And so right now, I, we're sitting at my office, and I've got my employees that I can hear in the background somewhat. I know there's things going on. I know it's like our busiest time of season, but I can't control any of that right now, right? I need to be in the moment, and I need to connect with Jared. I need to connect with James. Um, I need to, to make sure this podcast is effective, and, and hopefully we can benefit the listeners on this. But uh, I, that's a, kind of the thought that I put into it. You know, control what you can control. Be in the moment. Put your distractions away, and do everything you can to benefit that person. You know, that sounds like mindfulness. <laughs> oh, and yeah. we've already <laughs> podcasted about mindfulness. Nice. I, I would add to that, and I love that. Um, one of the things that I think you can lose track of, though, too, is you can become a professional networker and lose maybe some of which I think is beautiful. You know, I love networking and, and that's where I get most of my connections from is, is my network. But I think a lot of times you can lose track of, you know, doing that one thing that you were setting out to do. So, so yeah, it's great to have this big network, but if you're not mindful, yeah, there's that word again. Yep. If you're not mindful about what you're setting out to do, you can kind of get lost in that as well. And so I, I would I would really share with the listeners to, to check yourself. And I do that, can I say I do that every single day? I'd like to think I do, but sometimes I, I get caught up in whatever. And so I think taking a moment of just step, stepping back for a minute and just assessing kind of where you're at, because that's gonna change too. I will say this in July and August of this last year, I was networking like crazy because I didn't know anyone really in the HR space. Now that I built that network, now it's about executing and really deepening those relationships, and and then and then also you know making yourself available so you can you can educate and then ultimately provide the services that you provide. Great advice. Thank you guys so very much for your time today. Thank you for disrupting this industry, James. We're so glad you're part of the industry. Yay! Wow, that's fantastic. <laughs> um, so keep up the great work, and thank you guys so much. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks.